Hello, everybody, and welcome back to that Milan podcast. Martino Puccio, Matt Santangelo alongside me. Um, coming off another victory. Um, very nice. I think, it, funnily enough, Milan have still been undefeated in their most recent matches. Uh, once again, this one was probably, again, one of the more relaxing victories of the season, uh, Santangelo. So before we get into all of that, how are you doing? Um, got the nice jacket on uh, that you so desperately wanted to put on before we started. Uh, no, I'm doing well. Uh, had a good Thanksgiving holiday. Hope you guys yes. who are listening and celebrate. You guys did as well. You guys were safe and enjoyed the food. Um, yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's been good so far. You know, winding down the rest of the year. Busy, but you know, yes. kind of uh, enjoying some football, enjoying some family time. So it's 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 been good. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Really glad that Milan could get. Uh, taking care of business. Obviously, that Champions League match was something uh, to not be the proudest of, but again, the result is the result, right? Um, so with this one, I, I really just want to get into it and and how from the get-go, it kind of seemed like with this starting lineup from Paulo Fonseca that there was going to be a lot more bodies committed centrally. Uh, it kind of lined up a little strange. For some people, thought it was three at the back. It just clearly wasn't. Um, the fullbacks weren't push far up enough and there wasn't actually three center backs on the pitch for this. So obviously it wasn't a three, four, three. I think this was more of like a four, three, three, four, four, two hybrid. Uh, again, like players move around so much during the match. They cover different areas. It's not necessarily that they're married to certain positions yeah. and, and, and areas of the pitch, which is something that we say all the time. So Yunus Musa gets in. That's really the big change in this entire formation of, him being deployed on the right-sided area where naturally you either have Pulisic on the right wing or even Samuel Chukweze. For me, every time where you saw Musa in this match, and we'll get into Musa and all these other things, you kind of saw him track back way further than a lot of other players yeah. or natural right-wingers would be. And then obviously being more involved in the buildup as opposed to attacking and being more direct with the ball because we know he struggles in the final third, which what we kind of saw most of uh so yeah your kind of thoughts of like this setup here there was immediately more balance and and uh you know body centrally uh to kind of help with stuff in transition and police still kind of had some chances but they weren't as threatening or you weren't as scared as recent matches um would you agree with that yeah so i'm i uh, just want to pull up a couple stats from saturday as well just more yeah. of a broader context to the conversation um and again the scoreline 3-0 milan controlled this game throughout i don't really can't really pinpoint any singular moments where i think empoli were posing a real threat for milan i mean i i didn't really see Magnon's name get called much defensively we were pretty pretty organized i don't think there was any sort of um doubt that we were going to win this one once you saw like the first you know batch of min minutes in this one but just again on the stats topic so uh, Milan had the possessional advantage, 56% to 44%. Um, total shots registered was 24 on target to Empoli's 9-0 on target. So, again, that kind of speaks to what I was just saying, right? Like, this wasn't really a true barometer and measuring stick of, you know, have Milan's defense turned the corner, right? Have we shown signs of being able to be at least average um, as a defensive team. And I don't think this was really a true test of that, but the expected goals, 2.29, 2.54. So by all accounts, this was a pretty simple win for Milan if you're looking strictly at the numbers. And I think the eye test and the performance, if you did watch the game, uh, does speak to that as well. If you actually were able to vis uh, visibly see this game because of the yeah, fog yeah, yeah. smoke, it made for a difficult watch initially. Um, but some really good finishes from Tijani Reinders, who won the man of the match. Two goals to his name. I think he's got 11 goal contributions in all competitions. Uh, yeah, year. it was something you tweeted out. I'll pull that up. And last year, I think across all competitions, he had four goals. Four goals, three assists, or four goals and four assists. So this is a player that has really raised his game by all accounts in the final third. And this was something that we really spoke on heavily you know, in the buildup to the season, right? In preseason, we're like, Tijani is too good of a ball striker. He's too good of a creator, playmaker, and a technical yeah. uh, uh, aspect of this team to not put up better numbers in his in his sophomore campaign with us. And sure enough, we're seeing it, right? So beyond just what he does in the midfield, which is 
an awful lot for this team, and it's why you're seeing a lot of links to Manchester City, Real Madrid, and the like. He's also adding goals and assists to his name, and he's he's really you know raised his game in, in his second year. And um, Morata gets a goal, right? Two similar goals, the first two put re- Milan really in the driver's seat in this one, and then the second goal from Tijani was uh, you know by all accounts the 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 closing goal that you know really put Milan in position to start to rest some players, rotate in, and all those sorts of things. So that's sort of my general review recap of the match, how I saw it. I, didn't, again, didn't think there was any instances where Milan's defense were called upon to do anything extraordinary defensively. We looked better organized, and I think that's a testament to the fact that the game sort of swung in our hand in our favor. When we went up 2-0, we could kind of play behind, not risk a lot. We have a lot of games coming up, right? We have Sassuolo in the Copa Tai, which we'll talk about in preview. We have Atalanta on Friday. So this the, the fixture list gets pretty bombarded here. So for us to get a 3-0 win at home, relatively untested, unscathed, was exactly what we needed. Yeah, um, and you mentioned the big uh, part about how Milan really needed to just have this comfortable win. I think it's probably the biggest because, as we mentioned, I think in the preview for this match or the last podcast on how we haven't really had many comfortable wins because we were discussing about how the Champions League, you know, a 3-2 grind out against a side who only had scored four goals excuse me with that game had scored only four goals within Mm -hmm. the champions league and we allowed half of them so so with that like you were just itching and chomping at the bit to get a result like this you know players get substituted off get a little Mm -hmm. bit of a rest and a break um obviously the quick rotation with this one against Sassuolo we'll get into that they're first in Serie B so clearly they haven't fallen off too much um I guess we'll kind of start with this Morata goal He came close uh, right before that. Teo had a fantastic touch pass to him um, that was saved by Davis Vasquez. So shout out to him. Um, A lot of former Milan players within this one, Colombo on loan as well, Pellegri. Um, So again, um, it was really unfortunate, I guess, because of the fog. We couldn't see that corner getting rewarded for that. Um, They were creating chances, man. The pressing was well. Empoli wasn't too dangerous in counterattacks. I know they had some injuries, but at the end of the day, Milan did everything that they could to control this match, bring balance to the midfield and the central areas. Uh, again, Chow, I thought, had a very solid match, so it's just something for him to build off of. Gabia mm-hmm. is just... You could just see, by the way, I know body language is like funny and it's ironic I'm bringing it up, but you could literally see Gabia be so confident yeah. um, with, with, with the way he is playing that he is taking onus and leadership uh, very seriously. And I think he's just that type of personality that you would really want within your squad. He doesn't really say too much. He's not, he's not too loud of a figure. And again, there's nothing wrong with having a big personality like that, but this is exactly what I always talk about that leaders lead in different ways. Notice how Gabia isn't this sort of guy that's always barking at you and and getting angry all the time like a Gattuso type. He is more of the quiet, reserved guy who's just there to do his job. And obviously, he shows emotions in those big moments, scoring the goal against Inter, huge tackles inside the box, preventing chances from being scored. So all those things culminating in just a very comfortable victory for Milan. Uh, Again, TG. I mean, you spoke about it, like, obviously, there was a lot of spats on social media prior to this one regarding him. Um, I mean, listen, this is he's in the form of his life right now. I know we love to talk about Pulisic, who Pulisic also got an assist on Reinders' first goal. Mm -hmm. I guess it was too difficult to tell for some people. Christian, oddly enough, really quick before I switch back to Reinders, Pulisic, very oddly selfish in this match. I I wanted to speak on that too, yeah. So, so, so... He gets the assist for Rinders, but there was, uh, I believe, a Two to three. shout out. Yeah. He had TG or Leao there for a layoff. Sky's a left footed shot, I believe, where he tried cutting inside to finish. Uncharacteristic of him. Sometimes it's okay to be selfish. That moment really wasn't the one to do so. Uh, yeah, just kind of the performance from Polisic in, in general. It really wasn't bad. Like if they, these are the worst ballistic performances, we're gonna take them all day, right? And they come against, and they, yeah, and they come against Empoli, and they come against in in a match where chances and space were there. I mean, you Pulisic and Rafa had moments where the space was afforded to them, and 
you know, look, I think we often criticize, you know, Rafa and him specifically for being in those moments where, you know, we want him to shoot a little bit more. And I know sometimes when he shoots, it's not the best shot. But in a match like this, where I think that that space and those windows of opportunity are there, I want my top players to be aggressive. I want them to show that confidence. This is the match to do it, in my opinion, right? Pulisic has been playing exceptional football for Milan um, so far this year across all competitions. He's in really good form for for country as well. So in in, in moments like that, I I want to fault him because this smart decision would again to be a layoff pass to Rafa who can come across the ball and maybe one time and Johnny who is coming in on the edge of the box and you know is our one of our best ball strikers and had two goals in this game so you, you think the logical choice for a player that is as tel- as intelligent as Pulisic is and makes the right decisions more times than not would just lay that off but I can't fault him he's got a great left foot he scored a couple goals last year with that were fantastic with that left foot so I can't really knock him for taking those chances yeah. and I want our players to be aggressive in the final third and I think that what this yeah. game does in games against teams like Empoli, and when I say teams like Empoli, is those moments where you can throw up a, a lopsided number, right? You can throw up yes. three goals and your players can find some confidence. Those are the games where you really look to, right? Everyone will pinpoint the the Derbys, the Juve games, Napoli's, the like, the Champions League fixtures. Yes. But matches like this is where a player that might be struggling or you know maybe hasn't found that, that goal that's been evading them or that assist or that key performance – you can use these games against Empoli to break out of a funk. And that's what I would love to see from Rafa. I know he's been playing well. Maybe the numbers don't I thought he did pretty well in this performance, one. The performances so of late. But I think in matches like this, I want him to be aggressive. Because if he can get a goal or two and assist, now that's like, okay, he's getting he, he's getting those big performances statistically. That can also go with the eye test. And I think it just makes things a lot easier on him. So, yeah, the, the attack was was flourishing. But it was great to see Morata get a goal. I think that was a big, important thing for him as well. Um, he hasn't been click, clicking and scoring many goals lately. So for him to get a nice finish there, I think, is something that um, you know is great heading towards the end of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just can't get over how weak the guy is. Like he gets bodied like yeah. constantly. I think there was. But then sometimes he has moments where he'll play back to goal and he'll be physical and he'll hold up the ball. So it's yeah, like, because it's oh, just well. a modern footballer looking for fouls and not yeah, being it's, a tough player. Yeah. Like it's it like dude, like he got bodied shoulder to shoulder um, when he was tracking back yeah. defensively. Like it was just like it was like I felt embarrassed for him for like mm-hmm. how easily he went down with that. Um, but yeah, Reinders phenomenal. All these players phenomenal. Really, I think the story of this was is kind of the circle back on him is Eunice Musa. Um, more and more uh, as as the weeks go by, it seems like Musa is gaining more trust from Paulo Fonseca. Mm-hmm. Um, getting I, and I really I think it's fairly obvious that it started with the match against Real Madrid. Yep. Huge opportunity for him, really put in a fantastic performance, irregardless of Real Madrid's form. It's still Real Madrid at the Bernabeu in the Champions League. All mm-hmm. bets are off, right? So so when Musa puts in that sort of performance, and let's face it, right? We know in the 4-2-3-1, and we know plenty about Musa that there isn't necessarily the perfect position for him he's not a true six he's you know that type of player who's not again just turned 22 years of age so forget how young he is um i think there's been serious growth i think positionally the way he is attacking uh, in terms of aggression there was one pass i think it was a little bit behind morata that he sent in the final third but again those Final third woes are very much continuing with him. It really reminds me of Kessie because if you remember, Kessie sometimes would just, it would just feel like his brain shut off in the final third and he just had Mm -hmm. real difficulties scoring or making the right play at the right time. Um, Just overthinking and trying to do too much. I think that's really what Musa has to work on. I think he's going to continue working on that. But the other aspects of his game in which we saw on full display here is just that work rate is just phenomenal. Um, It really allows Royale to push up a little bit further. And honestly, for Royale, this was one of his better performances in a Milan shirt or probably one of the only good performances that he's had. So have to give credit where it's due with to him. Um, Again, I think Moose is just bringing far more balance in this midfield. And and I know Fofana, obviously, we haven't even discussed him. He, He did great as well. 
he's just really starting to settle in, and I'm, I'm happy to see where Fofana's at. But just as far as Musa goes, Matt, just to expand a little bit further than earlier on, uh, this, this player seems like he is finally someone that Milan can slowly start to rely upon on a week-to-week basis and matches like this. Maybe we'll see how many minutes he gets tomorrow against Sassuolo. But realistically, I think Musa is starting to kind of get an identity of who he is within the squad and 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 build off of that. So so what did you make of his performances and just also his recent performances as a whole? Sure. Yunus Musa, you know, his role was a little bit obscure coming into this season. I think that people were looking at the way that Paolo Fonseca wanted to set up his team and they were saying all the things that you just mentioned, right? Like what is his actual role? Where does he fit best, right? He's not a player that you would feel comfortable enough throwing out there in a double pivot, not to mention you don't feel like he would be the one to unseat Fofana or Reinders in that double pivot. He's not a true winger. He's a He played wing back at Valencia. He's played wing back a little bit for club and country, but like generally speaking, you don't consider him to be in that role long term, right? And I think the Real Madrid performance was something that we had to give Fonseca credit for because he threw him into a difficult environment in a role that maybe isn't too familiar to him. And he was that balance in the midfield that we absolutely needed. And he would show his willingness to get forward, to press, but then he would come back and he would help in the buildup. And this was something I mentioned on spaces at halftime and at full time um, this past weekend, where a question was posed about Musa. I think it probably came from a, you know, an American. So they were kind of maybe speaking a little bit to like the U.S. men's national team and then obviously crossing over to his role with Milan. And we both agreed that you know, he is that player that feels like that versatile cog that you can throw into the midfield that can step back, give you that three midfield number. And that's something that we've wanted to see, right, where, you know, we want to see a 4-3-3, but we also don't want to limit Musa and what he can do going forward because he is so a really good ball ball carrier. He's physical yeah. and he can do many different things throughout a match that they maybe don't show themselves on the stat sheet. And I think that Real Madrid performance was a microcosm of what he can be for this team as a player. But I think when you look at ultimately how he fits within this team, I think he is right now the perfect worker within this workman's like midfield that can provide the balance that we need. Fofana, he's been playing fantastic despite logging a ton of minutes. And Fonseca did mention that in the buildup to this because people were asking him questions in the media You know, and he pretty much replied with, you know, me paraphrasing that, you know, he's playing too good. He's too valuable right now for me to bench. And I think it just speaks to the growth that he's really enjoyed these past weeks. We know what Tijani's provided. So I think that ultimately, if you can put Musa in positions where he can provide some cover for those two players that are in really fine form, I think that's going to really shed light and really elevate Musa to get the credit he's deserving and the minutes he's deserving of at such a young age. And I think that's ultimately going to be something that really benefits him because you're seeing, right, that there's not a lot of midfield options that he has to compete with, right? Tijani and Yusuf um, Fofana are your two. Ruben Lothashik has been getting minutes as, you know, a bench option, occasionally starting. Maybe Lothashik starts in this game against Sassuolo. Who knows? Then there's really not many others that he has to compete for minutes. So by showing how versatile he can be and how good he can play in uh, several different roles, that has really put Yunus Musa um, higher on the pecking order. And I think it's really given Fonseca that confidence to say, I can choose this guy and I can put him in several different roles. And I know that performance won't drop off. Yeah, a- absolutely. And and uh, again, we talk about, I think, realistically, like how thin Milan are. And again, this yeah. is not to attack this player as well. How much better they play without Ruben Loftus-Cheek is startling. It is so bad on on how much more fluid they are. He really, like, quite honestly, and I'm not really trying to be this harsh, like, he has no spot in this team. He has no role being here. If Milan are going to be able to play with this sort of balance that they did against Empoli and, you know, like, put more players centrally, I don't I don't see how Loftus-Cheek fits in. He is not somebody, in my opinion, who is – how much better is Loftus-Cheek better than Musa right now, if you were to say that? Well – it's difficult to say, right? Because I think that you know we've 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 unpacked what his role within this team should be, 
He is not a player suited for a double pivot. He is a player that, if anything, he's more suited for a three-man midfield. So if I'm speaking to the role that Fonseca's put Mutsa in as being a player that can drop in to provide that, that numerical number in the midfield, can Ruben Loftus-Cheek do that? Maybe. But right now he is, isn't doing it to the level that I think that Musa can. So with that, that's where I thought you're, I'm starting to see a pattern here in trend here that I think it's pretty obvious that when it comes to certain matches, Fonseca will lean Musa's way more than he will Ruben Loftus-Cheek's way because, again, of the versatility. Ruben Loftus-Cheek, Ruben Loftus-Cheek can provide some things that will help and benefit this Milan. But I think generally speaking, there are limitations to his game that – see him as one Massive dimensional and if the game calls for it fine because he is a strong player he can carry the ball Ruben Loftus Sheik but I think there's other elements to Moon, uh, Eunice Musa's game that Ruben Loftus Sheik simply does not have which for that reason I think that again Musa um maybe he might not be at that level as Ruben Loftus Sheik yet as far as again the 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 body of work the experience and the like but I think if you're asking me who do I trust more in this given moment to put forth a good performance against any team. I do feel that it's Yunus Musa. And I think that if you're Fonseca, who has shown the capability and tendency to lean with the player that is playing better, he's done it with the central defense, right? Like we're seeing Malik Chow start games a little bit more often now. And I feel like that's what he's going to be going with going forward. So is that what Fonseca does here? I think he does. I think I think Loftus Cheek is the odd man out, man. I, I really do, too. do. I do too. I think he's four. And truthfully, you know, I don't know what the time frame is on Benacer's return. We see him training. Training is ramping yeah. up for him, and I think he's projected to come back in January. But it's going to make for an interesting conversation for Fonseca because it, when he comes back, is Ruben Loftus Cheek your fifth? I, I don't know. I, he that's is. A I think, I think he's getting relegated to that kind of position. And by the way. I know growth decrees exist, and I think he's grandfathered in with it, but he was get paid a lot of money. So to be paying that player that amount of money that doesn't have a role to play on a consistent basis, and nor is he putting in great shifts or performances within mm-hmm. that. And again, it's not 100% his fault, right? Because this is, again, a reflection of management not understanding where what the puzzle is in the first place and what pieces to put into that puzzle. Like they – forced this 4-2-3-1, and they were buying players that are not double pivot sixes, defensive midfielders that are complete mm-hmm. midfielders, right? Very one-dimensional, as you said, with Loftus-Cheek. So, again, um, and we see Pulisic keep getting the run as the number 10. Moose is going off to the right side, Chukweze. And, and again, that's a reflection of Loftus-Cheek being left out within the squad. So I, I think that's a kind of an indictment of where he is at in his Milan tenure. Uh, we'll see what happens. I don't think they're going to be too hasty and make mm-hmm. a decision in January. But um, I think I think a lot of question marks and and, and stuff are going to be coming for certain players this coming summer. I think Loftus Cheek could be one of them. Uh, we'll see. Again, I do not mind Loftus Cheek in a four three three against kind of lesser sides. But if Milan are not going to rock with that sort of formation and not put him in the position to best suit his abilities then I don't see why he should stay uh, because I think it's just a waste of everybody's time, his time. I think he could easily play in some other teams throughout Europe that would be happy to have him. I just don't think Milan are one of the squads. So any other final comments on the Empoli one? Francesco Camardo almost scoring a bicycle kick. Uh, that was sort of a, a, a really crazy almost moment mm-hmm. yet again for him. Yeah, I mean, I think you you saw when he came on, right? He came on, I think, in the 83rd minute. So he didn't have a ton of minutes to really find his footing. Um, but I think you saw, you saw the way that this game was shaping up once he yeah. did arrive uh, into the match, right? Where a lot of the players were trying to f- funnel that ball and force that ball his way, which obviously you don't want to press and you know, steer away from you know your way of doing things and your play style. But I think the match was done and dusted at this point, obviously. So I think they were trying to see if this was the opportunity. Hey, maybe we can get Camarda to he could steal a goal, he get his first goal. And I think that was kind of the approach. So I don't hate the way that Fonseca's truthfully utilized Camarda. I don't think he's quite ready to be, you know, getting consistent starts. Like I just don't think that when you have Marata and you have some of these other guys that are available, Tammy Abraham as well, there's no reason to get Camarda. 45 50 minutes in my opinion i think that you know the reason why he got that start a couple weeks ago was because of injuries and lack of options but i think you know and maybe in a copa italia match if milan do 
uh, find themselves in a favorable position, maybe he gets a little bit more than seven to 10 minutes. Maybe we get him 20 minutes, right? Like things like that, I think that's where Fonseca can benefit from a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I think the goal, the goal, I think the goal will definitely come this season at some point. It's just, again, it's going to really matter ultimately what, you know, moments he enters the match and what the game calls for. But it was, it was great to see him. I think that if he scored that, I tweeted this, if he scored that goal, I would have like passed out. Like that would have been crazy. Um, but I just wanted to really quickly shed light too and give some props to um, Fofana once again. I think yeah. that, you know, another assist from Fofana, a player that is providing that element to his game along with T. Johnny Reinders, right? So we're getting some creativity from those deeper midfielders. We're getting players that, are showing the work rate. They're showing the tenacity and the pension to get forward and and make some things happen. So uh, beyond what Fofana has been doing, I mean, he's been logging a ton of minutes. It feels like he is taking the the mold of, of a Frank Kessie, which, you know, for all the criticisms that Kessie got years ago when he was at this club, man, the reliability and the fact that you can throw him, pencil him in every single match day, and you know you're going to get a pretty solid performance – that's the role that Kessie provided for us. And I think right now, Fafana is that player for us. Because truthfully, when you look up and down this roster, we really don't have a player that can do the things that he does as far as, you know, maybe not being an out-and-out -out defensive midfielder that sits in front of the defense, but having the defensive like qualities and also the work rate and that drive to get forward and to, to make some things happen, right? So a uh, big shout-out to Fafana. He's been playing fantastic. And I think it's going to be absolutely crucial the fact that he didn't pick up the yellow card. So he is available for the Atalanta game, which is massive. Yeah. Uh, he also commented he on commented that. He commented on that too. He's like, He's I had to be careful that I didn't get a yellow card in this game. Dude, and I'm like, like, like I, I, didn't even, I didn't even know it. No, Knowing us and knowing our luck, he would have picked up a silly yellow by pulling the jersey. And if truthfully, if there were other players in this team that were in the same situation that he was on a yellow, like Teo, whoever – I would have bet the house that they get that yellow card because how many times has Teo been booked and now then he gets suspended for that next important game? So uh, good on Fofana for having the wherewithal and the understanding to be like, this isn't the time and place to be taking silly fouls and silly cards because I my team needs me. That's how important I am. So don't this you, is don't a player you that's great how one. much he, he kind of cares. And again, these are always a contrast with so many different players and personalities, how much he cares, how quickly he, how, how important he knows it is to be available for his team. Yes. And I think a couple of people, I forget the account. So excuse me guys, but the, the accounts were mentioning, I, it might've been what, what got you so mad was, was talking about, he rejected Manchester United. He rejected a couple other top clubs that could have paid him more money to get to Milan for this situation. I think for me, that is, those are the players you want to recruit. Yeah. The, that That's like the Maldini mold uh, and the Masada mold of like, we want guys who want to be here. We don't want yeah. guys who want to come in. And that was obviously a problem for a very long time of players coming in here just to play for the club, right? I mean, you kind of see it with a couple of the guys who refuse to leave at this point in time, right? <clears throat> Rigi. So when you get that kind of stuff, um, it's great to have. And, and it's almost, it hasn't been seamless, right? Because he struggled a little bit at the start of his tenure yeah. here. But just in general, you just you just love to see it. A couple of bad moments, sure, it happens, but also a lot of great moments, and and that level of consistency has started uh, to been a, a float here. I still think, obviously, the midfield. And there's a pattern, real quick, too, and then we'll move on. Obviously, Go for it. Yeah. there's a pattern, right? Because we've been praising, and social media has been praising all that T. Johnny Reinders has been doing, but it takes two to tango in that double pivot. And the reason, or at least some of the reason for how T. Johnny has been coming on strong of late this season, I think obviously has to be, you know, sitting with Fofana because he's been putting in the good performances that have maybe freed up T. Johnny to do a little bit extra moving forward, to have that coverage on the back end and to be a player that can provide more in the final third. So and the fact that those two players have formed harmony is great but i also found it funny too because they're playing really well as a tandem right now and we weren't far removed from a couple months ago i forgot what performance it was maybe it was after the Bayer leverkusen match or maybe the liverpool one i'm not sure where F fonseca said oh no i can't play t johnny and fofana together like he basically said something like that and i'm like no you can it's just they haven't gelled right away so just wanted to point that out as well that them two together have been really uh coexisting and, and playing harmonious good football yeah absolutely um moving on to Coppa Italia I mean these 
One after These the other, bro. guys don't die. They don't <laughs> can't get rid of them. How is it possible? It's that always they them, find bro. their way back. They didn't sell that many players in Sassuolo. Milan, I, we we've talked about this. We've known that they're facing Sassuolo for a while. A while. Um, a stretch of bogey teams here for Milan. The week of bogeys. Um, Sassuolo Atalanta, two teams who have tortured this club. Um, potentially more torture, and a lot of it happens in December, too, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. I think the Atalanta 5-0 drubbing or whatever that scoreline was, 5-1 to one drubbing, was uh, taking place in December in the in the start of the Pioli era. Uh, Atalanta actually played today. They're going to have one more day of rest, uh, regardless of comparison. Reg uh, but but the point is Sassuolo Milan. Um, fixtures that have gave us a lot of pain, a lot of joy. Um, realistically, only a couple of games there was a lot of joy to take away away from because the most part if you're Sassuolo anytime you get a result against a club like this it's phenomenal and they did get them quite often uh so for again with Milan and Sassuolo here to get back in the good graces of the fans um in general not only with this squad this this sort of management group and even Paulo Fonseca himself this is one of those competitions you have to step up and have great performances and make a deep run in and hopefully even potentially win because there's not going to be too many opportunities, right? I think this good. It was a good, by the way, great week for Milan and Serie A in terms in terms of gaining points. Thank, by the way, thank goodness for Bove being okay. He is alert. Absolutely. Fiorentina has stated that, so there wasn't any gain or losses with the Fiorentina Inter uh, uh, clubs in the standing. Gaining two points on Juventus um, was was pretty important. Uh, Lazio lost to Parma, so gaining three points on them as well. Was also massive. Napoli won yesterday against Torino. And uh, Roma Atalanta played today. Correct. Yeah. Um, so again, I think there's just been a lot of situations here in which Milan really control their own destiny and narrative to kind of put the fans at ease, right? Now, sort of, you're looking at the Champions League. You're feeling a lot more yeah. calm about that. And, and rightfully so, Serie A, obviously not. Um, but there's been small margins of improvement. Here at Coppa Italia, listen, man, they won twice since, I don't know, Ronald Reagan's administration, uh, this competition. It's been really brutal for them. They haven't won it since 2003, 2004. I believe, or if not, it was in 2005. It's been a minute. Been yeah. a minute for this club. I think beating Sassuolo... It would make everything taste sweet, regardless of where they are. They're first place in Serie B, Matt. They're no slouches. I don't yeah. believe they got rid of Loriente. Um, I'll get out the 11 that we are supposed to be uh, having for this one. There's going to be some rotations. So this is coming over from our good friend and uh, uh, guest on the podcast, Loft uh, <laughs> Ali Fisher. <laughs> Loft is is in the starting 11. We see Sportiello. Um, Fonseca said that uh, Mike Magnan went to the dentist, and that's that's why he's also not playing goalkeeper. <laughs> Hey, I feel you, bro. I've been there four straight weeks, so um, Godspeed. Calabria, Tomori, Pavlovich, Terreciano, Fofana, Reinders, Chukwese, Loftus-Cheek, Leao slash Okafor, and Tammy Abraham. Love to see Tammy Abraham feast in this one if he has the ability to do so. Loftus-Cheek, we understand if they, this kind of, again, feels like a 4-3-3 kind of lineup. Mm -hmm. um, so again, Fofana, Reinders, hopefully don't play too much. Uh, with this, you got some Musa on there. Kevin Zarola is apparently injured. So there are some rotations and players called up. Davide uh, Bartezaghi, Jimenez were also called up for the squad in this seat. Uh, for this sheet, they're not playing or starting as of right now. Um, again, Tamori and Pavlovich, uh, this is just the back line here. Please, just please, guys. I Two players there. that need good performances. Two? I see three. Well, I'm talking the players you just mentioned, central defense. Like I was Tomori, talking about the defense as a whole. I'm well, sorry. yeah, as a, as a whole, but I'm saying like I would Popovich, probably actually say all Popovich and Tamori yes. who are healthy. They're not banged up. They're not I starting just, matches. Uh, and Tamori specifically is a player that you know, garbage. Yeah, that they haven't been playing well at all. And this is not going to be a match where you know it's it's going to be a uh, untested. Okay, this is a great match for them. They're going to go in there. The threat is not going to be there. They can get an easy clean sheet. No, guys. As Martino just mentioned, Sassuolo are first in Serie B. They haven't lost in 12 matches. And I'm just at a glance going to give you guys some numbers of their season. So, so they have um, 10 wins, four draws, one loss. 
goal differentials plus 19. They have some of the usual suspects that we've come to know that are still producing for them. Domenico Berardi has a goal and seven assists. You have Loriente, who got six goals and one assist on the left side. So that should be a real treat for our uh, really stout and, and fantastic right backs that we have, right? Um, and Thorsved, I think I'm saying his name correctly. He's got seven. Yeah. yeah, he's got seven goals. Right. So um, th there are threats in this team, guys. This isn't going to be. They're going to they're going to be back up next year for sure. Yeah, I, I think they're a team that's a probably lot. better than Venezia. Like, I think would you consider? Yeah, them, yeah. Like there's teams in Serie I think they got really kind of unlucky, to be fair, to be right. Yeah, I mean, I know they were they've been a thorn in our side, but there's a reason why they have I think they've been prior to getting relegated. They were in Serie A for 10 years. 20, 2013, uh, over over 14. ten, I believe. Maybe over yeah, that. they must have got uh, in there like around like twenty thirteen. I want to say. Yeah, with, with, with De Francesco, right? And so, obviously, I think if Berardi doesn't tear his Achilles, it's a totally different story. That yeah, guy, that's, that's a them. huge. Well, I mean, he's huge. their club's greatest ever yeah. player. He's got one of the most unique careers. I mean, Volpato is another player that um I believe was Roma youth. I think he's Australian, um or grew up in there. He's an Italian Australian. They got Obiang, Pedro Obiang. Who Mula Thierry is another like uh, yeah. hot young prospect. He was at one point. Again, I, I unfortunately really haven't been able to watch as much as I used to in terms of, well, definitely not Serie B, but just in terms of just Italian yeah. football as a whole. Listen, they're dangerous. They got to this point. This game is at home too, which you like that, right? Obviously, that is something that. I mean, they're not. <laughs> you say that, but they're not. But no, no, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not Again, I, I home away doesn't matter. I, I think the point being is they that, beat like, Lecce two 0 by the way. You don't have here. to make any sort of travel arrangements for this club. And you know, again, I'm I'm trying to make excuses for this team, but I think it's important to also point out the fact that um, on a another stat that I'm going to provide everyone here as well. Once I pull it up, we have from Opta. This was after the uh, okay. victory on the weekend. Milan have kept a clean sheet in at least five of their first seven Serie A home seasonal matches for the first time in over 20 years, six in 2002, 2003. So the fact that for how bad we've been defensively this year, the numbers, the performances that we've seen, Milan are still like, they're still getting clean sheets, which is weird. Like, I think it's the performances that they've, dropped points in have been damning it's been like they're either getting a clean sheet or they're giving up three goals is kind of how it feels like with them I which is a problem many, many right because you don't know what this, this year. you don't know what this team's like floor is you don't know what their ceiling is because in real in the game against real madrid they gave up one goal they clean sheeted inter they've put forth some good performances on the weekend they were pretty more or less spotless defensively there really wasn't many opportunities for empoli to you know, put cause much harm. So I think that they are capable of putting in those good performances defensively. But in matches like this, I think that what's going to be very important and crucial for Milan is it's not Malik Chow, it's not Matteo Gabi, it's two other players that have been questioned regarding their their performances. Can this be a performance for them to find some form? Because the truth of the matter is this: we're going to need Tomori to step up. We're going to yeah, need he Mori to, to yeah. raise his game because this is a player that we viewed as a starter since he arrived. And all of a sudden we're at this point now where we're like, play anybody that can get us. Him, good him and Gabia are opposite trajections, honestly, yeah. like where Gabia was in the first half of last year, Villarreal had to have some starts and I know Copa del Rey here and there. He wasn't yeah. getting the consistent run of minutes, but it was more minutes than Milan. Mori was fantastic. Prior to that injury, he was huge in, in mm -hmm. actually really saving Milan um, from getting completely dropped out of all the European play. He was great against uh, Newcastle in that match. He had a bevy of other performances, yeah. then comes back from the injury, just not been the same player since. Gabi, obviously, coming back on mm -hmm. from loan, has been that stalwart. Tamori, I think he hasn't really been consistent. The performances as a whole have not been great. Maybe it's a get-right game for him. Maybe he can do that. Uh, he really needs to show that. I thought his closeout in the game against Slovan Bratislava on that goal, just not it. Just the awareness is not there. And I defended Tomori a lot. And we had Jod come on the podcast. And Jod was very critical of Tomori for quite some time. And I always thought it was a bit harsh. And, and you got to be honest, John has been right with this. Um, yeah. So Tomori needs to step up. He's got paid way too much money. He's been... 
uh, coined and, you know, like you blame myself, blame many others that expect more of him. You just haven't seen that. It's been frustrating. Pavlovich, I mean, this guy's just a straight up mercenary. Again, I'm sticking with the Serbian Paleta label that I have given him. I am, I'm going to stick with it. I, I, I still think he can become a fine player, but I have zero trust in the guy because he's just, he's just insane. Um, again, with Terraciano getting some burn here, I think this is sort of something that I think he deserves that. He hasn't been awful in his more recent performances. I, I think it would be nice to see him get a run of play there. Bartezaghi or Jimenez getting some run in this. Would love to see it. Um, don't want to use Alvaro Marata at all in this. No. Uh, again, I think we have to go to Camarda. Uh, hopefully Milan is a good, good enough position. Okafor wasn't healthy enough to play in, over the weekend. I would like to see Okafor start. I wouldn't be opposed to Leao starting to kill off the game sort of early on. Rotate out, fixture, uh, not fixture-wise with that. Against Sassuolo, they made it far enough into this competition with you wonder how they treat it. Again, obviously, you always want to swing big in a competition like this. But what's more valuable for them? Getting back into Serie A and being healthy enough and rested for that. Um, again, this they beat a Lecce squad 2-0, uh, by the way, which did we want to do a quick shout out? Dante. Dante Rivich. Dude. Bro, you got to scale up. Love it. I think a lot. A lot of people didn't know who the manager was of Lecce or who they had recently hired. And when the cutaway went after they drew, <laughs> I mean, just I, it was just so oh, funny. Justice, man. I think that's the first time Marco Giampaolo has smiled and since he got sacked or started at Milan. Um, honestly, like I never had anything against the guy other than how awful he was as a manager. It wasn't cut out for I, I, I always. And also don't always believe he was as bad as he was at Milan. I think that kind of stuff is a domino effect for a person mentally. Where what, what made him what made him his tenure so poor was the fact that, you know, we we spent a substantial amount of money for him. That was the summer we brought in Rafa, we brought in Teo, we brought in Isma Benacer. And through like the first seven to eight matches, whatever many games he coached, like we barely saw those players play or start. So it was very damning that it was like Pioli comes in, plays those guys, and we're like, oh, these guys are all really good. What was John Paolo thinking? That was what kind of did him in. Well, so, yeah, and then also yeah, his press conference. Out to Redish, obviously, showed no emotion whatsoever scoring the goal. Um, it was, you know, more of like an opportunistic type. He was in the right place at the right time, good run towards the towards the box. And I'm so happy for him. He had a um, terrible end to his tenure at Milan, and, and that yeah. was a lot of it was on him. Yep. I don't think he carried himself as a professional and did the things that were needed to do um, in order to you know stay at the club in a longer-term phase. So, again, really cool. Happy that Rebic got something like that. It benefited Milan. Mm -hmm. um, again, Gianpaolo, finally, finally he helped Milan do something. Um, and look at that. We're right around 45 minutes. There's not much left to talk about. Give us a prediction, Santangelo, for tomorrow. I'm going to go 2-1 Milan. Um, I think it's only right that we expect the goal be conceded with how much we're rotating. Um, I, I think, think, it's, going to be some, I think it's going to be a little cagey for us because I think, as you just mentioned, Sassuolo might see this as an opportunity to knock off one of the big dogs. And they this could be a competition that they can really be a, a thorn in the side of many big clubs because those clubs could be vying for more important obstacles uh, or important objectives, excuse me. And I think that uh, Milan will get the result. I think it's a tricky one though, because again, Fonseca mm. has to find that right balance between playing a team that's very competitive and showing the fan base and the club that he is going for a trophy that you and I have agreed we want to win. And regardless of where it ranks within the scope of Milan's trophy chase this year, I think it's only fair for us as fans to say, hey, if the Real Madrid's, the cities of the world don't punt on these competitions and don't take them lightly and they want them to win, why should Milan be any different? However, having said that, again, Milan need to be careful because three days later, they have a really important measuring stick and game against Atalanta away in Bergamo. Now, Atalanta play against Roma today. At the time of recording, it's Monday. So they'll have... 
a little bit more rest, but at the same time, Milan can rotate some of their guys out. So I think it's very crucial for Milan to get a match that isn't super intense, that doesn't really exert a lot of their resources and energy. Because again, Atalanta, we respect them quite a bit as a club. Mm. And I think it'd be a reason to believe that they're going to give us everything they have on Friday, regardless of what lineup that Gasparini puts out there, which, you know, uh, CDK smells blood because he wants to get a goal against his team. So. Got a goal contribution last time he played us. Um, shocker. That he but he's, a, he's, he's on fire right now, like numbers wise, like at least. Uh, honestly, like. Actually, the dumbest shit I've ever seen is how he didn't get into team of the week for the Champions League. Yeah. I dude, five goal contributions, and they're like, oh, um, good luck next time. What? It was the performance of the week. Like it he should have been Champions League player of the week. Yeah. I don't give a shit if it was against last place young boys. Like we praise Messi, Ronaldo, all these guys for beating down on teams like that. Yeah, I never under I never understood that too. Like you can only play You're the also clubs. That are, you can only play the clubs that are in front of you, and in most leagues, the drop off in quality from like the top four to five, six clubs, maybe bar England, is yeah. pretty substantial. So it's like what I can't fault a player where it's like you're. I mean, you're giving him this team, and he's putting up five goal performances. Like he's not putting up some fluky assist. Like he's destroying them. Like he's showing that he's head and shoulders above them on the day. So like, yeah, I, I don't know, but I think again, point being. Milan have to take this game very carefully. You want to take it seriously, but you have to take it carefully as well because, you know, you obviously are circling that Atalanta game who always play us tight. And we respect them as a, in my view, a, a title contender with the way they've with they, uh, been playing so far. Hopefully. It's a result, bro. It's a result. True. 3-1. All right. Sassuolo. Okay. They're gonna. They're gonna. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think it's three-one Milan. Um, I, it could be more goals, to be quite honest with you. Uh, but for me, I think there's just been a positive run of form. Again, it could be Jekyll Hyde Milan. Absolutely. But, but um, for me, I think they go in, they go and kill off this match early. I think that's what they're gonna set out to do. If this one is tight throughout, um. That it bodes very well for Sassuolo. That could go to penalties. We'll have Sportiello. I think Sportiello will have a good game. Um, again, just got to see the starters put their foot on the gas at the start of this. I think mm -hmm. Tammy's going to have a very good day. I think Tammy Abraham scores. Uh, he had a fantastic match against Slovan Bratislava. So, again, I think Tammy stepping up. I think he's done pretty well. I know he had some turbulence because of his attitude, other things uh, so far for the start of the season, but it feels like almost every single time he comes on, he does a pretty good job of contributing. Finishing needs to be more consistent though, because sometimes you're like, holy shit, brother. We know why no one pays up front for you. Um, so again, best of luck to Tammy uh, and Milan uh, tomorrow. So we both think they'll win. We'll see what we could do in terms of a preview for Atalanta or post-match for tomorrow. Got a lot going on. So, again, guys, thank you so much. Again, follow us here on uh, That Milan Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, uh, TikTok, and many other places at That Milan Pod. Again, oh, wait, by the way, I'll also predict this. Camarda gets his first goal for Milan. It'll be against us. Uh, and, again, uh, be sure to check me out at Martino Puccio everywhere and Martino underscore Puccio on Instagram as well, where uh, a lot of this Milan content gets uploaded. Probably going to be way too slow of a week for that. We also just had uh, some other stuff. Again, we appreciate you guys still trying to tune in. There's a lot of you guys that still tune in despite how brutal the season is. We totally understand. You don't want to sit and watch through Milan content. I get it. I've done that myself. Um, so I, I get it. Um, again, thank you guys so much for that. Santangelo, just plug your stuff real quick sure, here. Me on Twitter at Matt underscore Santangelo. Follow my brother and I at AC Milan Bros. Follow us at That mm -hmm. Milan Pod as well, as you guys can see on the bottom. We truly do appreciate the support. And, of course, as Martino just mentioned, you know the season hasn't gone according to plan so far, but things feel like they're on the up and up. The results feel a little bit more uplifting so far. Again, I could be eating my words after the next couple of matches, but we do really, truly appreciate the support. We do appreciate the regulars in the comments as well. And um, hopefully you guys have a happy, safe, and healthy uh, holiday season as well. Yep. Thank you guys so much. And uh, Forza Milan.